Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to really thank the organizers of this event and for you uh, to come and hear me. Uh, so the title again of my presentation is uh, Global and Regional Water and Food Security Challenges. Uh, and under this title, I will try to cover uh, very briefly, because I don't have a lot of time, a few things. First of all, I would like to present uh, the general problem, the food, water, sanitation, energy nexus. And because I don't have time, I will focus on food and water. Uh, of course, with some examples and highlights. Uh, then I will zoom in into our region. Uh, I'm coming from Israel and look on some uh, uh, ways for better management approach. Again, with some case studies and examples. And I will try to finalize with my uh, personal perspective. So I think that uh, everybody in this room knows that uh, water has become a big problem. And the problem is just getting bigger and bigger. And in this respect, I will just uh, mention a recent report that was published last year by the UN, predicting that in 30 years, 45% of the world population will be living under water scarcity. 45% of the world population is a lot of people. And we need to deal with it. I'm coming from a region that lives with water scarcity from the establishment of our country. So it's something that we um, had to deal with and find some solutions. Now, um, it's also worth remembering that when we're talking about dry land, some people think about rare areas in different places. We're talking about more than 40% from the overall terrestrial area and more than 35% of the world population. And this number is just increasing. Again, a lot of people are living in dry lands. Now, the main reason for the problem is quite obvious. We all know that we live um, in a time where, when there is a very significant population growth, there are different models you can see here uh, uh, that give different values. But overall, there is a very, very uh, uh, significant population growth. And when we're talking about population growth, uh, we're talking about more people. And more people need more food. Um, and more food means more water, a lot of water. Now, just to um, remember, to produce one kilogram of meat, we need between 5,000 and 20,000 liters of water. So it's a lot of water. While we uh, um, talk about drinking, we drink about three to five liters per day, say. But the amount of water that is needed to produce the food that we are eating every day is between 2,000 and 5,000 liters per day. So actually, most of the water is being used for food production. Now, um, another thing that worth remembering is that when we are talking about uh, slides are, uh, population growth, we are talking uh, especially about the developing countries, the weak countries. And in these countries, in these countries um, water and food are a major problem, or I would say the major problem. Okay? Um, this presentation is not about the developing country and the water crisis in the developing countries. It requires a different presentation. But I will just uh, show a few numbers to understand where we are. More than 1.5 million kids are dying every year due to water-related disease. About half a billion school days are being lost every year due to water-related disease. So it's a very, very big problem in uh, these countries. And I decided to show these uh, pictures just to um, uh, show that it is quite clear, and you don't uh, have to be a a uh, physician or an hydrology professor to see that if you drink the water in the uh, two um, uh, pictures in the bottom, your likelihood to be sick is much higher. And these are just some pictures that we were taking uh, during expeditions that we are doing with our students in uh, rural villages in Africa. So um, if, if this presentation was given, let's say, 15 years ago, uh, lack of water was considered to be problem of the uh, poor countries, like the countries that we see 
we have seen in the slide before. Nowadays, we know that this is not the case anymore, and we have severe water problems even in the richest country, and the best example is, of course, the United States. You know that in the western part of the United States, in the last five, six years, there is a significant drought, and uh, we see very, very big water problems, especially in California, but not only. So it's not a problem of the poor countries only anymore. The reasons, again, uh, I don't have time to elaborate, but we have seen the population growth, with it, uh, which is the number one problem, but also desertification, uh, climate change, and it doesn't matter if the climate change is part of a natural cycle or the result of man-made activity. We do have climate change, and we do have more and more droughts, extreme events, and crazy seasons. Um, and of course, the increasing uh, uh, lifestyle is also resulted in the uh, need for more water. So the bottom line is that having money and not having water became uh, a common problem. Now, what is the water being used for? I already mentioned it. Each country uh, shows slightly different um, uh, pie diagram. But overall, about 70 to 75 percent of the water being used around the world is for agriculture, for food production. So I think that we can say that water use efficiency in agriculture is a major or even the major player in global water scarcity. Or in other words, we can say that food and water securities are actually the two sides of the same coin, because if we um, save water for food production, we are making a big change. Now, saying that, and although um, using efficient irrigation also makes business sense because you can produce more crop per land unit, the situation of efficient irrigation uh, adoption around the world is still quite low, even in the developed countries. And of course, that if we see the extreme cases of uh, China and India that irrigate way more than any other country, uh, of course, because they have a huge population and the uh, efficient irrigation is less than 10% from the overall irrigation. So we still have a lot of room for, um, uh, to, to be better, I would say. Now I'm trying to zoom in into our region. This is a, a satellite image of the, um, uh, the Mediterranean. You see the delta of the Nile up in the, in the left side. Uh, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And again, you don't have, uh, you don't have to be uh, an expert in remote sensing or hyd uh, hydrology professor to say that we are living in area of dry land. And that means that the demand and the actual consumption of water uh, uh, is, is way far beyond the natural replenishment, way far. And the first thing, the most important thing to deal with this situation is to see water as a scarce commodity. And if we see water as a scarce commodity, we can solve many of the problems and make things much better. And this is very important. So what can we do to better manage our water? First of all, water distribution across the country. Uh, of course, that in Chile, uh, you all know better than I am that there is a lot of water in the south and the uh, north is the driest desert in, in, on Earth, and think what could be if we, you could mix the water across the country. It could solve a lot of problems. And for example, in Israel, which is a much smaller country, this is what we did. Of course, um, optimization, the use of natural resources, is very important. And here, again, there is a lot of room um, for improvement. And I'm talking about quantity and quality. In many cases, the problem is not that we don't have enough water. The problem is that the water that we have are getting contaminated or too saline and cannot be used. So um, quality is also very, very important. Legislation and education are also very important. I don't have time to deal with it, but um, I will just uh, uh, mention that um, in Israel, by education, we managed in one year to save 15% from the annual water consumption, which is the amount of water of very large desalination plants. So education is very important, and we can do a lot. And of course, research and technology are very important. Now, this presentation is very short, um, and I can't talk about all these things, 
but I will talk about the uh, uh, natural resources a little bit and about the technology that are, of course, linked. So let's talk for a, for a second about the water balance. The trick is very simple. We want to minimize the output and maximize the input, right? It's very simple. So to minimize the output means to minimize the evapotranspiration. Most of the water loss is water that are being transferred to the atmosphere by evapotranspiration. If we can reduce the evapotranspiration, we can save a lot of water. Capture of flood water is also very important. You know that usually when it rains, it rains, and a lot of the water ends up either in the ocean or in terminal lakes, which are saline. And if we could capture this water, we could save a lot of water. And of course, appropriate agriculture is extremely important, as I mentioned. So this is, for example, an agricultural village in the southern part of Israel, in the Arava Valley, very dry area. And you can see that it's also a very agricultural area. All the greenhouses all around the village, all the people in this village are living out of agriculture. How do they do this? So um, again, all the agriculture is in greenhouses, uh, very smart irrigation, uh, subsurface drip irrigation, uh, and a lot of other things that I don't have time to discuss that saves a lot of water and enable agricultural activities even in such a dry place. So um, I don't have time to take uh, to, to discuss in details all the tricks and uh, things, but I will just mention one example, which is the drip irrigation. The drip irrigation um, developed in Israel in the mid-60s, and now it's a multi-billion dollar uh, patent uh, a lot of companies, uh, the, the, the uh, trick is to um, give the uh, water to the plants when they need it and where they need it. And this way, uh, you get very efficient irrigation uh, with efficiency of 90% or more and the maximum crop available. And this is just an idea. And as you saw before, the adoption of this method is still very low. So. Without getting into more details, if we remember two short sentences, more crop per land unit and more crop for drop, we could do a lot. And this graph, I think, demonstrates how much we can do. This is the per capita water consumption in Israel from the late 50s till nowadays. And you see that the country managed to reduce the water consumption to less than 50% than it was uh, 50 years ago. So only from this slide, I think that it's obvious that um, water use efficiency can be not a complete solution, but a very good solution uh, that can improve the situation significantly. Uh, another topic is, is the production of new water. And when I'm saying production of new water, there are two very different things. First is the reuse of treated wastewater after very good treatment, of course. And the second is desalination. So um, reuse of treated wastewater means that we are collecting our wastewater, treating them, and reusing them for agriculture. And uh, nowadays, we have technologies that enable us to um, treat the water to very, very uh, high level. In some countries, people even drink treated wastewater. In Israel, it's illegal, but it's doable. And you can see by the numbers here that in Israel, we are uh, reusing almost 90% from our wastewater, domestic wastewater. This is a huge number. And it means that every drop is being reused again and again and again. And it's way more than any other country. And because of that, if you look on the national consumption of the agricultural sector for water, till the mid-90s, when we started to use the uh, wastewater treatment, all the water was potable water. And from the mid-90s, we see less and less potable water and more and more reused wastewater that uh, um, is being used for agriculture. And of course, it's a game changer and it saves a lot of water. Now, I have to mention that when we are doing uh, something like that and we are using new technology, research is mandatory. We have to make sure that we are not creating any damage, either long-term or short-term damage, to our soils, to our groundwater, and of course to the crop. 
And indeed, there is a lot of research going on to make sure that we're not making damage. Now, let's talk very briefly about desalination. And this is a, a cover page from an old Time magazine. Uh, you don't have to be a fish to drink seawater. And um, in Israel, till 2004, if you wanted to drink seawater, you had to be a fish. And now, uh, just 12 years later, we are desalinating uh, more than 600 million cubic meters per year, which is almost 75% from the potable water in the state. And that means that we almost completely uh, released from the climate change issue because desalination is the same if it's a dry or wet year, okay? So this was, again, a huge game changer that changed the water balance for Israel. Now, uh, just to uh, briefly explain, desalination, which is reverse osmosis, went a long way from the late 60s. This is the first uh, experimental station of reverse osmosis. Uh, and this is the way that the factories look nowadays. Um, there's a lot of work, a lot of uh, science that get into uh, improvement of the reverse osmosis, of the desalination, to make it more efficient, cheaper, and so on and so forth. And these are just some of the activities that are being done actually in my institute to improve the desalination technologies. So in summary, I think that we have seen, and I hope that uh, in this very short presentation I managed to convince you, that water is really very precious resource but very scarce resource. On the other hand, it's a very unstable, very fragile resource. And therefore, um, uh, awareness, education, innovation, uh, and technology are really very important. So for my opinion, the food water crisis that I just briefly uh, uh, talked about is something that we cannot prevent. We just can't. There are too many factors, and we can't change them. But there is a lot that we can do and we should do. And if all the parameters will work together, the industry, the farmers, decision makers, and the experts from research institutes and from the academia will work together, uh, I think that uh, we can do uh, much better than what we are doing now. now in order to prevent critical mistakes, and unfortunately, there are a lot of examples for critical mistakes that in many cases are irreversible, you can't change them, or you have to invest billions of dollars to uh, bring the situation back to what it was before. Um, research is essential. And a lot of people try to save on research, because what do you need research for? Let's do it. And the price is very high. So we cannot assume that a technology or a method that was used successfully somewhere can automatically be used in a different place. We have to explore it and to study that and come up with the right conclusions. And as someone that represents the experts from the academia, I think that we can and we should um, improve this uh, global food water crisis Again, I just want to thank you again for being here and for the organizer of this really great event. Thank you.